Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dawn Danby, and I'm calling you here and saying hi from San Francisco. Um, and today we're going to talk about some work that we've been doing um, investigating sustainability and user behavior. So I'm going to talk a little bit about sustainable design with intent, uh, which is really based in a lot of ways on some research by a wonderful guy called Dan Lockton, who we've been collaborating with a little bit. Um, and I'd like to you know, talk with, with some of you for the next little while about some of the research that he's done and then how it can apply to doing sustainable design really through the lens of how your users are going to be interacting with the things that you design and make. So the big em emphasis today is on um, sustainable product design and product development. So we're really looking at the, the domain of industrial design and mechanical engineering. Um, as you may know, we run the Autodesk Sustainability Workshop. Uh, the, you can see the URL up there right now, uh, sustainabilityworkshop.autodesk.com. And uh, we are designers and engineers here at Autodesk who work on teaching the principles and practice of sustainable design. And so there's a lot of resources, all free, all available for you, for students, for educators, and anyone else who's interested in understanding concepts around sustainable design. A lot of our emphasis, um, you know, up until now has really been on looking at technical things. Really, how, how do you apply sustainable design using Autodesk products? Um, and so we get really into some very detailed things. Some of you may have seen some of our past webcasts looking at uh, green building analysis, looking at uh, simulation, that kind of thing. Today we're going to take a different angle and actually look at user behavior. So we're going to dive into some of that. and. Um, Please do ask questions as we go. We have, um, you know, for those of you who are on Facebook right now, uh, I'll try to answer your questions either during the conversation or afterwards, absolutely. Um, so you can probably see, I think, actually, if I just show you there, this is our website, and you can also reach us, um, reach me at, uh, at Eco Workshop on Twitter. So the big question that we're asking today is in what ways could you design or redesign a product to have less environmental impact? And um, you know, one way of kind of framing this is this is this thing that uh, that Dan Lockton has brought up. This is one of his slides. You'll see some of his slides throughout our presentation today, um, which is that 1.27 terawatt hours are wasted every year in the UK simply from the unnecessary overfilling of kettles. <laughs> okay, so people are boiling all sorts of water extra because there's really nothing on the kettle that tells them how much uh, water they really need. And so there's a tendency to just to overfill those kettles and, and obviously use a lot more energy than we need to. And now we know that, that there tends to be a higher per capita kettle use in the UK, but this just gives you a sense, um, you know, because com comparatively, this is 1.27 terawatt hours of a, out of a total you know, four, I think it's um, 4.3 terawatt hours the total of, of water get, that gets boiled. And so how that, you know, that might be an engineering problem, that might be a business problem, but in a lot of ways that's actually a user behavior problem dictated by the designer. So much of what we've been working on here in trying to teach is where do designers and engineers have agency and power in being able to design for more sustainability. And this is a really great example where there, there's actually a really uh, useful set of tools that you as a designer can bring into designing a kettle to give the user some feedback about how much water they need to use and therefore how they could use less energy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about designing for lower impact, introducing some design with intent um, cards and resources that Dan Lockton has developed, and uh, then getting into sustainable redesign with intent. Almost everything um, that we do at the Sustainability Workshop really does relate to the concept of life cycle thinking. So this is really kind of a big picture set of a uh, way of looking at everything as being part of a system. Now, I won't get into that right now, but we do have a great video on, on whole systems and life cycle thinking that, uh, that I would recommend that you take a look at uh, on our site. And this is just a, a screen grab from that. But when we're talking about um, design for intent and design for user behavior, that's one piece of the whole system that you might be looking at. So here, the example is looking at how you wash clothes. Um, you know, how, in what ways do, do, uh, does the user of a washing machine interact with the washing machine to get feedback about what they could do? You know, is it, is it the kinds of 
um, interface design that's actually on the washing machine, the kind of information that's on it. Does it tell you how much energy or water is being used? Does it give you cost breakdowns? Any of those things are user-centric, but the big system includes much more than just the user behavior, of course, right? So another, another piece that we always refer back to is the notion of life cycle. Um, and so once again, just as, as a recap for those of you who are not familiar with this, everything that we have, everything that surrounds us, all the objects in our world, come from a basic life cycle of, of resources that get turned into raw materials that are manufactured, used, transported throughout this whole system, and then end up with some kind of end of life. Now this is kind of a typical one-way uh, life cycle. And what, a lot of what we've been trying to look at uh, and teach about are what are the ways of closing those loops to be able to encourage repair, upgrade, remanufacturing, and recycling um, to avoid, in this case, having everything go to landfill. Now, the thing that I think is really interesting here is even if we were just looking at the issue of having products like you know, this phone, for example, not go to landfill, me as a user of this phone, I'm going to be asking myself, well, is there, is there anything that I can do? Or as a designer of this phone, is there anything that I can get the user to do to be able to encourage them to repair or upgrade what they've got? For example, there's a user design piece of this. You know, if I can take this apart, pull out the battery and replace it, I'm much less likely to throw it away because it no longer works. So there's, these, are, these are some of the, the kind of the framing for how we talk about this stuff. Don't worry, we're not going to get too, not, not too many more infographics after this, quite like this. So a really simple way of breaking down looking at sustainable product design, very simplistic, okay, is to say, okay, there's three main areas that, uh, that, we're gonna focus, that, that we could focus on. Today we're not going to look at all of them. In fact, I'm, I'm going to touch on a couple of them just to be able to keep moving. The first one is the product system. And so, um, you know, big picture questions, all of which are very relevant to looking at sustainable product design that are business level decisions around, you know, your supply chain. Uh, are there take back or recycling pro programs for, for products? You know, does, a, does an electronics company take things back? Do they make it easier, easier to repair, easier to recycle? Is there another way of delivering the service? Those are all business level considerations. They're also, they're very important. We're not going to talk about them today. Um, one of, one of the other things that, that we obviously look at is, you know, the impact of a product that's visible versus what, what's invisible, you know. And so, for example, um, when we make a phone, most phones create, they're tiny little things, you know, and they create over 80 kilograms of waste per, um, per phone in, in terms of just real, really raw waste. And so, there's really this, this principle that um, you know, every pound of, your, of material that you save in your product saves even more waste uh, and material upstream, right? So if you design a phone that breaks after a year, and so everybody has to, so one, the person has to buy a new one and buy a new one and buy a new one every year, that's another 80 kilograms of waste that are, that are thrown away every year. But if you're able to, um, to extend the life of that phone in whatever way, you're able to decrease that waste. These are um, largely business level considerations as to whether this phone is going to be repairable, but it's also design and user consideration about how we encourage the repair or the upgradability um, of the phone, right? So another, another obviously big, big area that we have tended to fo focus on primarily at the sustainability workshop, um, it's not all under engineering, but it does fall into the kind of the category of, of technical strategies. Um, so, you know, how can the final design use the least amount of energy, materials, and water? So a lot of these questions are quantitative. They're the kinds of things where, you know, you're going to measure life cycle impacts um, of, you know, amounts of energy or materials or water or carbon impacts. And so these are, these are often measurable, quantifiable considerations that we've done a lot of work at Autodesk to be able to simulate uh, these and, and really be able to estimate environmental impact as somebody is doing a design. You know, so for instance, um, this is actually 
a, uh, an image of computational fluid dynamics. Some of you, if you're not in engineering, you may not be familiar with this. Um, I'm not an engineer, I'm a product designer by training, but I do find this fascinating that engineers are able to actually simulate how um, heat and air move through a system to create the most efficient um, mechanical structure or design. Very, very cool stuff. Um, and we'll actually get to BioLite in a few minutes talking about some of their design side, the, the sort of design side of the equation, the user behavior side of the equation. But this is kind of the technical and engineering considerations that have to go into creating a high efficiency um, kind of low carbon product, right? And so we do a lot of work um, in that domain in mechanical engineering, uh, simulation. This is some stuff in green building. Again, not going to talk about that. Very important. Everything under life cycle analysis also falls under this category. So if those of you who've used um, our eco-materials advisor and inventor, uh, you may be familiar with that. This is an example of a project um, last year. You know, we worked with some students um, who just came to us, you know, as um, we were coaching them, essentially. They weren't, they weren't our are, we're not their professors, but uh, they're students at UC Berkeley who uh, were working in collaboration with the University of Mexico. So it was a couple of, um, it was actually several mechanical engineers. And, you know, they started out this project um, doing a lot of really interesting work um, in simulation. So that what you're seeing here is some outputs from our inventor tools using our Eco Materials Advisor, essentially measuring um, where the greatest environmental impact might be in designing a fridge. And so they did a lot of very important technical work to develop this fridge. And it was really a great project in a lot of ways. What I thought was really interesting, though, is that like all really good projects, this is not the final solution. You know, the things that the mechanical engineers developed or just the things that the designers developed, not the final solution. It's when they came together that you start getting something that's really meaningful from a sustainability point of view because it combines not just these technical considerations about life cycle that you're seeing on the screen here, but also gets into issues around um, usability. Which brings me to design and human behavior, which is the main focus of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so this is just a screen grab from uh, from the design team, once they'd worked with the engineers, about improving user experience of the fridge. Now, as many of you might be able to guess, if I were to say, how does a fridge lose power? You know, how do we, use, how do we lose energy through a fridge? And the typical, people know, you know, if you've been told by somebody in your household that you should close the fridge door, it's when you open the door and you just hang out there looking around and trying to figure out what it is that you're going to make for dinner. And so there's this really important user interface question about how you can design something to you know, discourage that most uh, impactful behavior, in this case, keeping the fridge open, the fridge door open. And so they developed a whole series of things like creating different, comp comp uh, different compartments, um, a quick view window, a caddy, really compartmentalizing the whole design such that people could see inside and make sets of decisions without leaking out all of that energy. And I think the other thing that was really important about this project um, and kind of what is most interesting about um, some of the best projects that we see is that they actually were working with Mabe, which is a, a Mexican manufacturer. And so not only did they have to consider all the technical things, the life cycle considerations, the user behavior considerations, but they also had to really go into the Mexican market and understand how to get something that would work uh, in that market, right? And so it combined all three of those domains into something that could actually work. But we'll t today what we're, what we're doing is focusing on this piece of it, the human behavior piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, I mentioned a little while ago uh, repairability. It tends to be one of our most favorite <laughs> examples. Um, it doesn't have to do necessarily with, um, you know, if we're thinking about electronics repair, it doesn't necessarily have to do the kind of with the daily use of most of our electronics. But we, we are so surrounded by electronics that repairability and um, you know, the ability to, to, to change out batteries and, and repair parts has become more and more important because we keep creating more and more electronics that are harder to repair. And so there's huge issues around e-waste, whole other topic. But from a user behavior perspective, there's a lot of things that I think are really important thinking about um, repairability. So this is actually a teardown of the 
of the iPad uh, by our friends at iFixit. Um, iFixit, if you're not familiar with, uh, have wonderful set of resources on how to do product repair for a whole series of different kinds of electronics. I mean, thousands of different tutorials on how to tear things down and repair them and keep them going. And uh, so I, I do love that the, uh, the iPad was a particular challenge um, for them to take apart. It required a can of Red Bull to keep people going, as well as a heat gun for heating up the adhesive to um, a consistent heat level. You can put guitar picks around the edges to be able to take the, the glass off to be able to repair it, because otherwise you can't get inside. That's, you know, that's discouraging um, repairability, obviously. And um, as a designer or engineer, you have the opportunity to do exactly the opposite. You know, uh, this is actually my students at the California College of Arts. I, I teach a class there, tearing down um, hard drives with iFixit, which is terrific. And I should just mention, because we are on that topic, we're currently running a competition with iFixit right now on Core 77 called the Design for Your Product Lifetime, which is really all about combining um, thinking about designing smart products like electronics with designing for user behavior um, to create something like creating a product that thinks about um, not only how people behave, but also how it can be repaired long term. So we're still taking submissions for student uh, for student entries until November 15th. I really would love to see what kind of projects you're coming up with. And so and I, to that same point, we actually have a whole series of videos and resources that talk about really specifically how you can get into designing for product lifetime. Um, so this is, you know, this is a screen grab from one of our numerous videos um, and how to's on how to do um, on how to do design for product lifetime and, and repair, upgradability, recyclability, and so forth. And again, you know, as it relates so very much to, to some of what we talked about um, earlier when I showed you the, the cell phone example, how do you have something that lasts as long as possible? So that you and that you can change or you can fix that a lot outlast all of the cheaper things um, that uh, that you might have for shorter periods of time, you know. And how you know so so thinking about durability is also an important consideration. We don't always want things to be recycled or composted. Sometimes we want things to last a long time, um, you know. So for example. One of the biggest challenges that we've got is is really looking at things that are kind of in the middle. You know, on one end of, of the spectrum we've got compostable things. On the other end of the spectrum we have things that last for, you know, s sometimes decades or centuries even heirlooms, and consumers, uh, consumer products right now. The biggest challenge we have are things that last a really long time, but uh, but have a tendency to uh, be thrown away in a short period of time. So electronics and appliances, that kind of thing. So, what are we going to do about that? In what ways could you design your product to have less environmental impact? Okay, if we were to set aside some of the considerations that we talked about in terms of material selection or uh, energy efficiency, what other ways and what other opportunities are there? So, design with intent is, as Dan Lockton puts it, design that's, that's intended to influence or result in certain user behavior, right? So, we often think about the, the idea of, um, of you know, user experience or um, or interface design is really being something that just happens on screens, and it does. You know, there's a lot of work that's being done um, on in terms of user experience that applies to uh, web design and uh, mobile device interfaces and that kind of thing. But th there's a really strong analogy to anything that you might have people interface with, right? Anytime um, I have to use, you know. A water fixture. Anytime I have to have to set a thermostat, I'm dealing with a, with a kind of interface that is guiding me in my behavior in some way. So Dan uh, Dan Lockton is a British uh, designer, researcher, practitioner, um, consultant, and uh, he's based in the UK. Uh, we got to know him as he was at, um, I believe, when he was at Brunel University, and. So Dan has a free download of this resource that I'll get into in a minute here called the Design with Intent Toolkit. You can download all of this for free from danlockton.co.uk. Follow him on Twitter. Um, really, really interesting set of research that, get, that really breaks down uh, the concepts around designing for user behavior and intent. Right? So um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit, but I also encourage you to go and, uh, and check out his site. 
And so this is, this is a little bit of what, what this looks like in, uh, in practice. Um, he's got a series of these things. He has about 101, I think, different, um, 101 different cards, all of which convey a particular kind of concept. Um, and so to illustrate just one concept here, um, this is actually a mug that I carry around with myself pretty frequently. And um, my colleague Adam was making fun of me at one point, just saying, like, you know, um, I'd mentioned to him that I felt like I was drinking too much coffee. And he said, well, I don't, why don't you just get a smaller mug, right? Um, because that would actually force me to make a really different kind of, uh, really kind of different decision in terms of portions of caffeine that I was taking in every day. And this is the kind of thing that we see in the, in the U.S. And, and in Canada all the time is, um, is we get larger and larger portions and it, it actually changes our behavior to how much coffee we drink or how much food we eat. Um, and so applied, you know, the, the way that, that Dan has looked at this is how might you as a designer change the size of the, size of the portions of the units or stuff that you give users? Okay, so very specifically giving things to people in small portions. There's variations on that idea, right? I mean, you can give something to somebody in a small portion, or you can give people feedback about the portions that they're, that they're, uh, that they're uh, delivering. So for example, is there a f uh, some kind of formal thing that helps you, um, gu that helps guide you on how much of something you're using? So this is a, another, another of his strategies from his deck feedback through form. Can you use the form of your object itself as a kind of interface so it gives you uh, feedback or suggests something to you? You know, this is yet another example. We've all um, seen this or been these people in airports. What's going on here, right? There's, there's a, an explicit um, guidance that's being given to us about where we can and can't sleep. And a lot of that is dependent on segmentation and spacing in the seats. You know, something is telling us <laughs> <laughs> very bluntly that you can't lie across these seats because you know that it would be incredibly uncomfortable and you wouldn't be able to nap. Um, and, and those are very deliberate design decisions. Um, and so what's interesting about looking at some of what Dan has looked at is that it's not always about encouraging, um, it's not always about, about encouraging people to do positive things for sustainability. It's often, you know, there's lots of design decisions that you see all around you all the time that are encouraging you to not do certain kinds of things. So, you know, for example, um, you know, car rental places where you're not able to, um, to, to move the car the, other, the wrong direction, otherwise you'll damage your, your cars. This is a threat to property, right? Um, what happens if, if your design threatens to damage users' properties if they use it the wrong way? And what is really wonderful, wonderful about this resource is that you're able to use some of these questions, these cards, as provocations as you're going through a design process. And so what we've been doing with a lot of these is running workshops with people, using it in our own work, to be able to do quick redesigns of projects. This is something that you can do with your classmates or you can do with your colleagues um, as really kind of getting them to think about user behavior in a different way. For those of us who aren't trained to, to really do um, human-centered design, which is really a, a big and, and wonderful and fascinating world. So, um, classic example, could the design encourage or teach the user? Um, I'm sure all of you have seen the example of the, uh, of the Prius dashboard, which is always used as, <laughs> as the kind of, the, the magic of, of uh, feedback um, in, in an interface to change how much energy we use, right? It's like the standard sustainability example. And so it has three things going on. One is that it's, um, it's giving you a score. So it's almost like you're playing a game with yourself um, that's always telling me how much am I consuming? It's scoring me on that. Um, it's giving me transparency. So there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's feedback right here looking at the screen that's telling me how does this work, right? And I, that gives me some agency um, and some real-time feedback that, um, you know, if, if I was getting that feedback after the fact, like if I was getting that feedback at the end of my drive, it wouldn't be as actionable. But right now it's telling me exactly how I'm driving and what the efficiency is. It's teaching me about that. It's transforming the way that I drive the car so that I'm able to really uh, use it the least amount. I, I don't know if you, those of you have heard of uh, the concept of hypermiling or um, people who you know, who are almost competing with themselves and each other 
to be able to get the most efficient uh, drive by the way that they operate their vehicles, right? And this is just one way of, of giving feedback to that. So we're back to this example of uh, the terawatt hours wasted every year in the UK, um, which is also described, this is uh, by an agency called DEFRA in the UK, as enough electricity to run practically all the street lighting in the UK, which I think makes a really good point um, about just the general impact of these small decisions as a consumer, but more importantly to you as designers and engineers, is how is it that, you know, when you're designing something, that when it's scaled up, when you make something and it gets made uh, in the tens of thousands or in the millions possibly, how is it that, you know, once multiplied, that actually has a significant impact on a country's energy use, right? So we're looking at sustainable design with intent, and what we, a lot of what we've been doing was actually pulling from some of these ideas um, that Dan had, so selecting a group of them. Uh, this is a photograph that, that one of my colleagues took showing, um, showing obviously sinks in airplanes. And uh, on the right, you've got one that, has, that, that requires that you push it in order to let the water go out which forces you to see in real time how much water you're using um, at 30,000 feet, which is a very useful piece of, um, of feedback. You know, of course, just basic infographics and, and awareness things about where, um, where paper comes from. These come from trees. Um, I do, you know, well, this is yet another example of, of <laughs> what happens if you, if you do something the wrong way and how it threats, threatens you. Um, and so we, we pulled from a series of these cards. Um, you know, Dan had 101 different patterns. We actually selected 54 patterns from Dan's full deck of 101, just looking at um, almost like four suits. You know, how do we inspire positive actions, you know, through the lens of sustainability, energy use, water use, prevent ne negative actions, give people real-time real feedback for decisions, and also uh, a series of wild cards, you know, some of the kind of um, more Machiavellian, I think, uh, strategies is, is I think how, how Dan put it. And so we've run a series of these workshops and I, I recommend you can try it out as well. What we did was we, we basically brought in um, appliances into a room with a range of different kinds of people. We've often had um, you know teams of, of folks who come into a room who never met each other. We put them in teams and they often have you know designers or engineers or professors or students or you know, journalists or anybody else and, uh, and put them in teams and give them an appliance, random appliance, and tell them, okay, make perfect toast but use less energy, you know, or, or look at uh, a shower head. How, you know, how can this, how can a shower head be redesigned to use less energy and water? Not by looking necessarily just at the technical problem of how to do that, not just the engineering considerations, although those are important, but also how might uh, somebody be able to design something that could, you know, let you switch the water off when you don't need it just for a minute, or turn it into a lower, um, lower flow uh, shower head temporarily, or give you feedback on how much water is being used or what the temperature of the water is. Those are all things that uh, that rarely show up, but would really um, serve to actually change how people use a lot of the products that we see. So, you know, we. We put people in rooms with, with some of these cards as provocations. We give them crayons and Play-Doh. Play-Doh is actually great because it lets people kind of actually hack products in real time. They're able to kind of modify the products. Um, and then we have them report out and, and, um, and present. So this is a very enthusiastic um, participant in one of, our, one of our workshops. But again, this is, very, this is pretty simple. This is, this is a, a kind of workshop that you can do in an hour and a half, and we have a whole breakdown on how we did that, what cards we used, where the sources come from. That's all on our blog at the Sustainability Workshop. So I, I recommend you take a look at that, and if you're interested in bringing this into your, um, into your classroom or into your house, you can do, do it over lunch hour. So I wanted to end with, uh, with an example because I think it's actually a really great project. It's actually quite timely. Um, this group called BioLite Stove um, just today won, or maybe last night, won uh, the Fast Company uh, Design Award for design innovation in the consumer products category. So it's pretty cool. And we've been, we've been really enthusiastic about them. We've written extensively about them. There's a, um, they use our, uh, our computational fluid dynamics tools, which I, which I showed you at the beginning. So remember seeing that, that image with, um, 
with heat moving through uh, through a model. That's that's the BioLite team. Now, what's really interesting about them, I actually am not showing you the product that they won the competition for, uh, for Fast Company, but rather a project that they, um, that they do, are doing concurrently, where they're creating a stove for markets in the developing world. And so they've got, um, you know, they have, they've had a couple of different versions of this, of this product design um, under development for the last number of years. And so this is a separate product from, uh, from one that they're selling into the, let's say, the U.S. market and more developing world market. In both cases, they are stoves. One is, the U.S. market one is a, is a camp stove for people who want to go camping. Um, and the other one that you see here, this is an earlier version, um, is one that is used for really bringing um, high efficiency, uh, low emission uh, stoves into different kinds of communities. This is a really big issue because it's one of the major sources for, uh, for carbon emissions and for um, illness and kind of respiratory issues in a lot of developing world contexts. You know, a lot of people cook indoors and they're breathing um, heavy duty particulate matter from these stoves. And so there's a lot of people who are working on better, more efficient, very simplified stove design to be able to address that problem. BioLite's one of those companies. And um, what I think is really interesting from, from uh, that perspective, so this is actually showing an earlier model. Um, what the stove does is it very efficiently is able to burn biomass, so sticks or whatever. Um, and then it actually has an output of, of energy that can be used to charge electronics. And so you'll see right on the, on the bottom part of that image, there's a series of different wires output so that people can charge up lighting, phones, mobile devices, that kind of thing. Um, same thing for the US market one, but this is, um, but you know, probably a slightly different application in both cases. And, and very much a testament to their, uh, their engineering skills to be able to create something that very efficiently burns something and then also has this really amazing um, additional capacity. And so, you know, they did not work with, um, with the design for intent cards, but it seemed to us that uh, in the redesign that they did, this is a, a more recent design, you know, when we talked to them, they told us that um, they changed the design of the product to really look more at how people were used to using stoves. You know, and in this case, they were used to being able to feed um, biomass, you know, sticks and that kind of thing in from, from the side. They didn't, you know, that that's naturally their understanding of how things should be, um, should be burned. Because I mean, if you had, what, what this is really replacing is what's called like a three stone fire, um, which is typically used everywhere where people have stones and they are putting biomass, that they're burning underneath the stones and are able to cook things from underneath. And so people are used to being able to having that kind of experience. And so the product was redesigned to consider those kinds of, uh, of needs. And so, you know, when just in looking back for us, we took a look at some of the, the um, design with intent cards and said, okay, between that, between the first design and the redesign, you know, what are the kinds of things that they looked at? And um, some of the things that they did were, were to simplify the product. They, they really made, um, you know, much simpler kind of interface, which is really cool. Um, they were able to really suggest a particular kind of action, right? They moved things in a, in a particular way just to, to recommend, okay, here's how you put, here's where you put the sticks and that kind of thing. And it's also quite clear um, how, like the serving suggestion is, is an analogy for, you know, how much wood can, can, the, uh, the, can the system take? And so there's, you know, these are just three that we grabbed this afternoon thinking that, it, that they related, but there's a number of different things that, um, you know, probably many, many more that this team will have looked at over the years of doing research in the field to be able to really begin to understand, okay, how do we make something that not only has that incredible high efficiency simulation on the engineering side, but also gets used and gets used right because typically that is the thing that sinks a lot of these kinds of projects is like is not just you know we have all as humans we come up with all sorts of wonderful technical solutions but it's often um something else like the business 
or the um, or the design or the you know user behavior that hasn't really been considered. So they've done a really nice job with that redesign. Um, with what you see here, I definitely work, suggest looking at them just because you know <laughs> some of the other things they've done just to talk about them for a second is that they've been able to with with the kind of stove that they've got done with this, with this final design they're able to um, have a 94 percent reduction in smoke emissions 91 percent reduction in carbon monoxide uh, and they're able to cut the fuel consumption by half compared to a standard three stone fire which is the the typical um, mechanism and so you know by having the wood fed from the side the usability is improved, and um, it's really much more consistent with how people in the developing world cook. So that's very, very cool in a lot of ways. So with that, I wanted to um, just leave you with some of these resources and um, to really encourage you to take a look at them. You know, we have a range of different things all, all over the sustainability workshop that will help you bring sustainability and sustainable design and life cycle thinking into the kinds of projects you're doing, no matter where you're at, you know, whether you're a student, um, whether you're teaching these kinds of things to students, um, whether you're a professional and you're trying to get familiar with thinking about sustainable design, there's a whole series of different kinds of considerations, like I said, that go into the whole system, that get into all kinds of engineering considerations, and we're very happy to have been able to work with Dan Lockton to be able to fold in a lot of his thinking and his work on design for user behavior because it has always felt to us as, uh, as one of the areas that, um, that we, we really felt was, was a wonderful complement um, to thinking about these other things. So please take a look at our site at sustainabilityworkshop.autodesk.com. Send me a note if you like with any questions. I'm at dawndanby at autodesk.com or send me a note at ecoworkshop on Twitter. And as ever, an extra spe special thanks to Dan Lockton at the middle of the night where he is right now in the UK, um, but you should get his, his uh, Design with Intent toolkit and take a look at that. Um, and if you have any, any results, if you, do, if you run a workshop, please let us know. We'd love to hear about it. We'd love to see your results. We're always interested in the kinds of things that you're working on and what you're doing. Um, so I am taking questions, but I'm not seeing any right now. So if you have any questions that you want to follow up with, um, please, like I say, send me an email, send me a note on Twitter. It's been great talking to you, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you soon. Okay, bye-bye.